G'day everyone, it's JD here and I am going to walk you through my pre-Marsh series uh, Supercoach team, the uh, plays that have just missed out, the ones that I think are do not touches. Uh, I'm also going to talk through uh, some of the selection criteria I use to build my team. Uh, and then finally I'm going to talk through the three biggest things I think you should be looking for for the Marsh series um, when it comes to actually finalizing your side. And these are really the top three things I think is going to differentiate who wins super coaches here and who finishes outside the top 1,000. Um, so it's one that I'm disproportionately putting my energy and effort into as we head towards round one. So without further ado, let's get into the team. So uh, I'm not going to cover the rookies at all. Um, these are my best guess for who they're going to be at the moment. But as we all know, that will develop through the Mars series and not only change the structure of our sides, but uh, those players quite dramatically. So in defense, I've got, uh, I guess, quite a cheap defense. Um, Sicily, Houston, Doherty, and Robertson are the four to talk about. Sicily, Houston, and Doherty, none of them have actually left my side since Supercoach started. I have been supremely confident uh, with these three, uh, and it's only Robertson that's really moved in and out. So. Um, when I am selecting players, effectively, I'm looking for the the players that are going to be the top in, at their position. So for defense, it's usually six, but sometimes I'll take seven and eight, depending on how close I think that average is going to be. And then I'm looking for those that are underpriced in some way. Um, so when trying to identify a player that I think is underpriced or value, I look for four different things. So firstly, are they getting a new opportunity um, or are they getting more opportunity? So uh, Boak last year was a great example of this. He was underpriced because he spent time forward, got those mid minutes and show up in value. Uh, the second is a player that is young, um, but is coming off a down year for whatever reason. Uh, so an example this year of that type of player is Oliver, who um, I think averaged uh, over five points less in Supercoach than he has in previous years. Uh, and there's some good reasons as to why that was the case and he should rebound. Um, the third is a premium that's coming off an injury and is usually discounted in some way, either because their average was brought down or because they got a heavy discount um, from it. Last year, that player was five for me uh, and definitely one of the things that helped propel me in my season last year. The fourth is looking for a, some type of player that broke out maybe halfway through last year, and they're gonna move into that new better scoring role, uh, but they still have a lot of those poorer scores from the old role included in. A great example of this would be Dunkley this year, uh, where he started off, I think, in the first five or six rounds as a forward at the dogs last year, and then really dominated the midfield for back half of the year. Um, so why are these four players value for me? So um, Sicily has scored better than uh, what he did last year. He got thrown up in the forward line a couple of times uh, and uh, maybe had to man up more than he would normally like to. Uh, so yeah, definitely some value there. And uh, I think a lock for mm. top six, very durable. Uh, and as long as he doesn't get suspended, which is the thing people worry about, his hot streak. Uh, he seemed to get that under control last year, so I'm not really worried. I think he's uh, a, a, quite a safe pick. Houston uh, scored amazing when in the midfield. Ken Hinckley's talked up that he's in the midfield. The first um, intra-club that Port had, he was dominating the midfield. All signs point to him being the defender breakout based on more opportunity, and that opportunity is going into the midfield. Uh, Port really needs his type of user uh, on the inside, so I think he's a pretty safe pick for now, uh, but one that could change the Marsh series. And finally is Doherty. Um, there's not too many defenders that can get you a 115, 120, uh, and Doherty is just a gun. If you didn't get to watch him play before those two ACLs, you're missing out because he is a sublime user and uh, a key part of uh, Carlton's defense. Um, now, obviously, some risk coming off two ACLs, and you've got new players in the side, such as Newman, that could um, take some points, but you also have things like Simpson on the decline. So. Um, I think worst case, even if Doherty doesn't get back to his old glory days, but still hits that 95 to 105 mm -hmm. um, average, he's an amazing pick and you have to have him. And then finally, Robertson. Uh, Robertson's an interesting one. Um, so one of the ways that defenders can kind of be value is if they get to move into that third man intercept defending role, uh, and then if they mix any type of kickouts now, um, or the defenses run through them at all, um, they can score an insane amount. and. Robertson's best scores of roughly 90 um, happened prior to the new kick-in rule. Um, now, I still think Shane Savage will be taking most kick-ins, 
but Robertson should be getting maybe somewhere between 25 and 40% of St Kilda's kick-ins, but one to watch during last year is, I think um, it's unlikely he's going to be a keeper, but I do think he can get to 450k, um, and in general for mid-price is going to make that um, you know, 150-200k mark that I'm pretty comfortable taking them, especially when there is upside that they are a keeper for the year, um, or maybe moving into the D7. So the other two defenders that I've considered but haven't got my team at the moment is Laird. I think um, Laird is once again another one of those younger players that had a down year um, and that's quite clearly linked to um, Adelaide's performance and then also some of the additions to the back line. Um, we're hearing interesting things like Brody Smith potentially moving up um, the field but the coaching change uh, always makes me nervous because we don't know how Adelaide's actually going to structure up behind the ball and that makes me kind of lean away from Laird even though he, there is some value there uh, and then secondly um, Zach Williams I love Zach Williams if I was going to pick a premium defender this year he would be my pick um, he's just one of those guys that not only is he great in super coach but he's amazing to watch um, obviously a fair bit of injury concerns can never seem to run out of game but that's also where his upside is if he can really string together a full year um, of actually running out games he's average there's definitely room for improvement the defenders that i don't want to touch this year um, and recommend that you don't either is um, jake lloyd uh, look i think he's going to be a top six defender for the year but there is no upside at his price i can't see him averaging any more um, than what he has this year and last year. And there is a fair bit of downside with the risk that um, Dawson moves into that back line and takes um, uh, both kick-ins, but then some of those cheap possessions that Lloyd seems to rack up like an absolute seagull. Um, the other two are the older fellas. Um, so these guys are north of 30. They have injury history, bad injury history, both of them. Uh, and they had record scoring years last year. There's no way that these guys repeat. Like, it's possible, but these are the... Like genuinely the worst picks you can make for defense this year. Um, so midfield, um, oh, I jumped ahead a little bit there. So the the five players I've got here are McRae, Kelly, Cripps, Dunkley, and Oliver. And when we look through them, um, there's only one of these players that I really see um, as uh, only one of the mids this year I see getting more opportunity, and it's not one of the ones I've put on my side. We'll get to him in a second. Um, there are three that had down years last year, and that is. Oliver, McRae, and Cripps. So I think um, there is potentially some regression to the mean for all these players where they can tick up a few points um, or potentially even more naturally, and there's a small bit of value there. Um, now, uh, I always call him Jelly, but um, <laughs> Josh Kelly, uh, definitely one of the guys that I think can improve his average due to having injury-affected years. Um, this is the first preseason that he's had uninterrupted, no injuries, and if he manages to get through that unscathed, he is going to be phenomenal. Uh, so he's an absolute lock for my side as long as he continues to be injury free through the, the preseason. Uh, and the other one worth mentioning is Oliver. He was coming off double shoulder reconstructions last season and as someone that's actually had a shoulder reconstruction I can tell you those things take a long while to work through and get back to your best um, so it does not surprise me that he had a slightly down year last year and I fully expect him to bounce back uh, this year and then as I mentioned earlier Dunkley is that player that uh, had a previous poor role stuck in the forward line at the dogs um, but then through the back half, he really smashed in the midfield. If he holds that um, midfield role for next year, he's got natural value built into his um, price. So that's absolutely a pick that I love. The other two mids that I am heavily considering. Um, so Patrick Dangerfield, he's a very interesting one. Because of his age, he's getting to that point where you could start to see natural decline of 5 to 10 super coach points over the year. Uh, and definitely as players start to hit around 29, 30, even the greats, that is when that can uh, creep in. But we've also seen players like um, Pritis, Sam Mitchell, Gary Ablett uh, win brown lows at 28, 29. So uh, I think this is probably... Um, on the precipice for danger of whether or not he's able to maintain his average. The thing that is going to offset this quite heavily is with Kelly gone and Stevens maybe not uh, fully fit to take over some of those mid minutes, we could see danger push quite heavily back into the midfield, especially as Geelong goes on a premiership tilt. And you could see danger getting his average easily back up another five, mm -hmm. 10 points and really mm -hmm. making him great value. Mm -hmm. So 
definitely a selection that I like. Um, and if I had six midfielders, he'd be probably number six at the moment. And then uh, Titch, I absolutely love him. I've He was the first play picked when I opened my side. I've gone off him a little bit um, just because I think there are so many midfielders this year that are sure bets to go 115 plus um, that um, Tom Mitchell has the downside of, yeah, maybe that leg isn't fully recovered. Uh, maybe Hawks have to manage him throughout the year and he misses more games than he otherwise should. Um, but uh, look, if he does get through the Marsh series unaffected, he's playing full time, they're not resting him, then I think he may find his way back into my side. The mids to avoid this year, um, so one Nathan Fife. Um, I, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Fife. I started him last year and was definitely one of the um, players that helped, uh, helped me ride to a, a really good finish last year. But I think um, his average doesn't really have much room to go up. Um, he had uh, obviously some off-season surgery around Brownlow time, which look probably isn't going to affect him too much. Um, but I am worried about um, coaching changes uh, at Fremantle when he's been talking about their game plan and their approach. He doesn't seem overly happy, um, so that doesn't give me a lot of confidence. Um, combined with the fact that his injury history isn't great, um, and I could see them um, resting him forward uh, for extended periods, I just don't think there's much value um, with Fife. Uh, despite yeah him being a great player and, and look I wouldn't be surprised if he finished top eight um, and then to the right of him I've got basically every player below Oliver um, I look as I said I think there are so many midfielders that are absolute locks to finish at 115 plus this year as long as they don't have injury affected years and I don't see any of that potential upside or at least find it really um, easily identifiable with anyone um, that, that's below that, whether it's um, Tim Kelly, Caniglio, um, oh, sorry, Canelio, um, Merritt or, or anyone else. So yeah, I, I just don't think you should be picking any of them because the money that you save is not going to be worth the points that you lose across the course of the year. Uh, for the Rucks, I've got Grundy gone for now. I... A lot of people have jumped off Gorn with the injury scare, but the reality is he's already running. They expect him to play preseason games. Um, and if he ticks both those boxes, I still can't see any other rock in the competition getting within um, 15, 20 points of, of um, Gorn and Grundy. So no reason to avoid starting him for now. But if for whatever reason Gorn does look like he's going down the gurgler, the Rucks that I'm interested in are Source Jacobs um, as that mid price. So there's obviously a fair bit of risk with that, especially if there isn't a, um, a rookie ruck playing. Um, of course, if Source goes down early, there's no one to side, right, sideways trade him to and you're in a, in a really bad position. Um, but then the other two, um, Rob and Lyset, are those that are sitting in that second rung below Gorn and Grundy that have the right profile in terms of um, young players, so Rob's only had one full season. You could definitely see that natural development, especially if Adelaide gets better. Um, it was pretty dismal last year, so there's definitely some room for improvement there. And Lysette, um, his scoring was much better when Ryder wasn't in the side. Uh, and so being number one ruck, um, left to his own devices, you could see him really smashing it out of the park this year, um, although he does have some injury history. The rucks that I think avoided all cost, uh, Nick Nat uh, and Marshall. So Nick Nat, Look, even if his body's right, he's never had high time on ground. Uh, he hasn't shown that he's got the round the ground capabilities uh, to actually score up with a Grundy or Gorn, despite the fact he's a very high impact and very exciting player. Just can't see him um, doing enough uh, or being fit enough to actually um, challenge for those top two spots. And then Marshall was an absolute darling last year in the forward line and is a, a really, really good player. I'm actually very interested to see how his development goes this year. But from everything we've heard, um, Marshall was, um, I guess, a little bit concerned with how he was getting beaten by some of the larger rucks last year. And so I really see Ryder being brought in as someone that's going to spend probably 50-50 time uh, with Marshall, especially, uh, sorry, time in the ruck with Marshall, especially in those games where the bigger rucks are competing. Ryder is uh, still a really, really good tap ruckman. Uh, and we can, I definitely expect him to share game time with Marshall this year. And that's probably going to be great for Marshall's development and Marshall's game, but not great for his super coach scoring. Um, so hard avoid for me this year. And now, finally, the forward line. So, uh, look, this is a little bit boring, and I've been tossing and turning. I really wanted to start Heaney this year, uh, but 
um, Long Last came out and said some ridiculous stuff about just keeping him forward. I just don't know what's going on there. So while I think um, Heaney fits the type of player I like, which is he was injured last year, so you should get some natural improvement off that. He's still young. He's had a down year. I, like, I think you'd be buying him at his absolute basement. Uh, the problem is with um, Longmire saying that he's going to stay in that position, there probably isn't too much upside either, which now makes me think that he's um, someone you don't have to have. That really just leaves Whitfield and Martin as the two midfielders in the forward line. Um, and really, when it comes to picking forwards, you're looking for players that are going to play midfield time. Uh, midfielders king, high half forward, that's a terrible super coach position. Small pocket, terrible super coach position. Uh, and when you look at key position forwards, usually only one of the top six is ever a key position forward. Uh, that's been Hawkins um, in prior years. It's been Buddy Franklin. Um, Cameron had a good crack at it last year, but didn't quite make it. Um, so yeah, you're normally looking for um, forward eligible players that are playing midfield and Martin and Whitfield are the two obvious ones um, in that. Uh, and then for now, I've also got Devin Smith, partly because he fits my price structure partly because the preseason word has been that he will be playing um, that mid-roll at Essendon, which I'm a little bit dubious about, but uh, we'll have to wait and see on the Marsh series. And then everyone else I'm considering is is basically every other forward. Um, Heaney, Barrish, Stevens, Lynch, uh, Segler, Greenwood, Wingard, Brayshaw, Bailey Smith, and Chase Jones. And uh, there's many more. There are so many potential F3s that you need to keep your eye on across Marsh series. And this leads into the three things I'm really keeping an eye on as we go into Marsh series. So the first is that F3 position. I think this is what's gonna make or break many sides. Um, I think defenses are gonna be quite similar. Uh, I think the midfields are gonna be very, very similar and, and very safe. Uh, but the forward line, especially that F3 position, is what's going to differentiate sides because I think Whitfield and Martin are going to be very heavily um, featured across top sides. Uh, so, yeah, that's biggest watch one is F3. The second is the expensive rookies. And while I said I wasn't going to talk about them going into detail, because I'm not, um, there are a lot in my side at the moment. Um, and I'm still missing others like Young uh, and Stevens, which are becoming increasingly popular, both at that 180 to 190k price range. Um, so how many of these we actually need to fit in our side is going to be very interesting because it's going to drastically change structures. Uh, and you may find some people take a punt on um, younger, uh, sorry, on cheaper, less safe rookies, um, but doing so gives them a great advantage across the year. So this is, I think, something really um, we need to pay a lot of attention to in Mars series. And then the third is what happens with those Ruck 2 and even Ruck 3 positions. So uh, if Gorn is pulling up a little bit ginger if there's more word that things are a bit dicey uh, and we do need to look at some of these other ruck options. I think that opens up things massively for super coaches here. Uh, we've been blessed with Grundy and Gorn for too long, so a little bit of chaos would be interesting. Uh, but I think that the strategy can also change whether or not there's a viable ruck three this year, whether that's Cameron or whether um, Draper from Essendon looks like he's gonna get games early. Um, you can then do riskier things, I think, like um, bringing in Jacobs and really going cheap in the ruck compared to prior years and um, upgrading or changing your structure quite dramatically. So um, those are the three biggest unknowns for me going into my series, the F3, the expensive rookies, and what we do with rucks two and three. Uh, so I, this will be my first and only update uh, from my team pre my series. I will uh, hopefully release another one before round one, uh, but I'll see you next time.